Hello and welcome to Kaboom and Aquarium's Discovery Lecture Series. I am Dr. Julianne Passarelli, the Education and Collections Curator at Kaboom and Aquarium. I will start with just some information for the viewers. This is a webinar style platform, so you cannot see yourself, nor can you mute or unmute yourself. But any questions you have, please put them in the Q&A feature. Typically, it's at the bottom of your screen in, a, in a, uh, a toolbar. We will get to the questions at the end of the lecture. During the lecture, if you think of a question, go ahead and type it in that Q&A feature. We'll also be monitoring the chat, but please use that for any specific questions about the aquarium and all questions for the speaker can go into the Q&A. Cabrimarin Aquarium is owned and operated by the City of Los Angeles Department of Recreation and Parks, and we are extremely grateful for the city's support. I would also like to thank the Aquarium Director, Chrislyn McCarran, and the Programs Director, Jim DePompe, for the support, and a huge thank you to everyone who has joined us tonight. The Aquarium is open from Wednesdays through Sundays from noon to five. All capacity restrictions have been removed, and we have resumed programming and we are following all state and city health department requirements. In addition, please be aware that the city of Los Angeles vaccine mandate is now in effect. If you're planning on coming to our aquarium, please be prepared to show proof of COVID vaccination. This is required for anyone 12 years and older. And if you're 18 and older, please also be prepared to show a photo ID. Your actual vaccination card, a digital copy of copy of your COVID-19 vaccination record or a photo of your card will work. Medical and religious exemptions will not be granted. Masks are also required at all times, including while in the courtyard area. We have some upcoming programs I would like to share with you. We do monthly beach cleanups on the first Saturday of every month. The next one is tomorrow morning on February 5th at 9 a.m. We have also resumed our, our public tide pool walks. Uh, we have some coming up next weekend, one on Saturday, February 12th at 12.15 p.m. and one on Sunday the 13th at 12.45 p.m. There is no need to sign up for these tide pool walks. Just come on down to the aquarium and join us and we'll walk out to the tide pools together. And on Saturday, February 19th at 2.15, join us for a walk Cabrillo guided by CMA education staff. During this coastal park walk, you will visit the native garden, salt marsh, the beaches, and the tide pools. Enjoy each habitat and examine fossils, native plants, and beach rack. Meet in front of the aquarium, so save the date for this fun walk. Before we get started, I would also like to thank and acknowledge the friends of Cabrillo and Aquarium for their support. We would also like to thank all the members of the aquarium. Being a member is a great way to support our aquarium while re receiving special members only benefits. Your friends membership helps support the aquarium's quality education, research and outreach programs. If you would like to become a member, visit our website for details or stop by the aquarium's welcome booth. For at least one more lecture, we plan to continue this series online. Our next lecture will be on Friday, April 1st, 2022. Our speaker is Dr. Mario Espinoza from the University of Costa Rica. The title of his talk is Turning the Tide for Sharks and Rays in Costa Rica. I hope you can join us for this online lecture. Uh, we are all really, hoping the following lecture in June will be back in person at the aquarium and as a hybrid lecture where you can either come in person or join us by Zoom. Um, we'll add details to our website soon. And I know I said this lecture was gonna be hybrid, but that was before Omicron. So we decided to move it 100% online. So April will be online and um, June hopefully in person. The upcoming schedule and speakers for 2022 will be posted on our website. 
There's a link uh, on our homepage under Newsflash called Discovery Lecture Series, and that will take you to the upcoming schedule. If you missed any lectures, they were all recorded and archived on our website on the Discovery Lecture Series page. Just scroll down to Lecture Archives 2014 to 2021, or you can go to the CMA YouTube page. If you're interested in the upcoming April lecture, again, our speaker is from Costa Rica, so it will definitely be online because he will not be local and you need to RSVP to receive the Zoom link. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce tonight's speaker, Rachel McPherson from the Port of Los Angeles. Rachel began her love of the ocean at a very young age. After high school, she spent her first year of college in Israel. She lived along the Red Sea where she began her 15 year career in scuba diving. She traveled as a scuba, scuba instructor and dive master doing underwater videography and photography and living at sea for an additional two years before she returned to Los Angeles. Rachel then earned a bachelor's of science degree in marine biology from California State University, Long Beach. She began her career with the ocean assessment group in the environmental management division of Hyperion Wastewater Treatment Plant. She also worked at SWERP and as an environmental specialist for the city of Los Angeles at LAX. There she oversaw compliance with air quality, water quality and hazardous waste management before transferring to the Harbor Department at the Port of Los Angeles. Now she oversees the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permits for stormwater, biological resources such as migratory bird management, and is the sustainability coordinator implementing Los Angeles's Green New Deal. The aquarium often collaborates and receives support from the port, and we are grateful to have Rachel here tonight. The title of tonight's talk is The Port of LA, Protecting Rich Habitat in North America's Busiest Seaport. Thank you, and we welcome Rachel McPherson. Hello, everybody. I, uh, I see that Ann Dahlke is here. I wanted to say hello. She was the person who gave me my first job within the city before I was actually a marine biologist. Um, and thank you, Julie, and to the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium for the honor of speaking tonight. Um, it's always been a pleasure to collaborate with you, and we support all the good work that you and the aquarium do. And I really enjoy getting my actual hands and feet wet doing surveys um, and trawls with you guys. Um, I wanted to add that not only do we at the Port of Los Angeles support the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium, but we also support other local entities like the International Bird Rescue Foundation and the Marine Mammal Care Station, also in San Pedro. Um, welcome everybody. I'm giving you a little overview of port history before we dive in. I think it's important to know where we came from so that we can see where we're going and what we've done to get there. So the Port of Los Angeles, um, well, this area was first um, documented by Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo. I know there are some local conflict over how to pronounce his name. So a shout out to the other Dr. Passarelli, or almost Dr. Passarelli, who, um, did some research and I guess Cabrillo was um, in Portuguese with an H and pronounced Cabrillo. Um, and we changed it to a double L to signify the Spanish pronunciation of Cabrillo. So I will say Cabrillo, you may say Cabrillo, um, but let's fast forward to 1850 when Phineas Banning began freight and passenger transportation and there's a tribute to him still in the Wilmington area, the Banning's Landing area. And then in 1907, the Port of LA was officially established as the gateway uh, for industrialized port activity. Um, and it was very important that the industrial activities were concentrated in one area, even though it seems so highly industrial, it's better to have them in one location than littered up and down the coastline. And originally the port was dedicated, you know, most of the industry was fishing, canneries, um, the oil industry and shipbuilding. Um, now the Port of LA is, 
the number one gateway of connectivity from Asian ports through the nation, because we have the capacity, the infrastructure, the space, the rail, the highway, the warehouses, and the size to accommodate all of that traffic. Um, fun fact, the Port of LA touches each one of the 435 congressional districts in the United States. Um, time is money, right? So if you're coming from Shanghai, it's 13 days to the Port of Los Angeles. And then it's almost fastest by rail, uh, another five days to get all the way across the country. Whereas to go through the Panama Canal would take you 25 days. That's why we are the busiest container port in North America. So we are um, a non-taxpayer supported entity. Um, we are entrusted by the state to the city to protect this region and uh, utilize the funds that come from the port back into the port. Um, we've always, uh, we're the land, we're a landlord port and we've treated it as such, but in the last 10 years and going forward, we're really transitioning to more of a partnering model where we can collaborate with our international partners um, and nationally and locally and to, with our supply chain stakeholders to balance the critical environmental progress we need with the economic drivers of the region. So when I say economic drivers, I wanna point out that one in nine jobs in the region are created through the Port of Los Angeles. And you can view some of them that are produced by our amazing communications and public relations teams on YouTube. Um, and you can see how we generate so many jobs in the region, it's the best place to forward our green job initiatives. And almost 40% uh, of the imports come through the San Pedro complex. And we also had our record year of 10.7 million TEUs, which is 20 foot equivalent units since containers are all different sizes. We measure every 20 feet. In 2021, that was the biggest year we've ever had. We are committed to managing our resources and conducting port development and operations in an environmentally responsible way. Um, that's really what we're gonna focus on tonight. Um, and then how we know how well we're doing. So we're gonna try, we're trying to reduce our impacts from our operations and provide efficient green services to tenants and customers and conduct community outreach and development. That's basically the three-legged stool of sustainability. We were the first city entity to have an environmental management division. It started in the 1970s. Um, Geraldine Nats, our former um, director of the port, is a marine biologist herself and came through EMD. EMD has several different sections. I'm gonna briefly describe them. Um, there's air quality, site restoration, CEQA, which stands for the California Environmental Quality Act and water quality, which is last but not least, of course, my favorite subject. So air quality tends to get top billing because of the health impacts of the surrounding Wilmington and San Pedro communities from the emissions from vessels, trains, support vehicles, and so on. Um, and I just wanna point out that the basin that we are in, if you can see in this map, the, the mountains that ring the air quality, um, the Los Angeles basin really trap in all of those emissions and they just kind of sit here and get a little stuck. Um, and it's one of the biggest challenges we have. So you might be familiar with our Clean Air Action Plan and some of our incentive programs that have drastically reduced criteria pollutants from the 2005 baseline from the five major critical source categories. Um, and we continue to develop near zero and zero emission vehicles and technology for on dock and drayage trucks because as a public agency, we have a responsibility and the ability to fund these programs that drive technology throughout the world. 
We incentivize cleaner vessels to come here and supply chain efficiencies. So being in the water group myself, I'm of course very interested in the air water interface and how pollutants from tires and brake dust and emissions um, get into the water and what those pollutants are, mostly um, heavy metals. Um, but aerial deposition is definitely a concern. We also have another program that is focused on air quality called the Vessel Speed Reduction Program, which helps um, reduce air emissions by optimizing engine speeds from 40 nautical miles and 20 nautical miles out. But since we're focusing on water, there's a corollary benefit to the migratory whales and the resident blue whale population because when the ships slow down, it's not only good for air quality, but it's good for vessels to help avoid ship um, whale collisions. Uh, that's a little more about air quality than I intended to say. So let's look at the history of the port a little closer. It's an interesting story. Um, there is a legacy of contamination. In the 1920s and the 1930s, the port was a leading exporter of oil to the world. It was long before OPEC and this area was very rich in oil reserves and it was a number one export. We were also um, the major importer of lumber in the 1930s uh, and lumber contains creosote. Uh, 1940s, we were heavily, 30s and 40s were heavily invested in shipyards and shipbuilding, which contributed a lot of PCBs and other heavy metals and contaminants to the water and ground that started in um, really to support the World War II effort. And then in the 1920s through the 50s, even into the 60s, we were a booming fishery and canning location. In the 70s, it slowed down. In the 80s, it pretty much went overseas. But we do still support uh, our local fishers and we provide them berthing space and dock space for their equipment and um, reduced rents so that we can still support what's left of the local fishing communities. Um, these were the major sources of contamination and it took a while to regulate and control them. And we're still dealing with the after effects of all that pollution. Um, that pollution is located in the ground, as I said, and in the water. So we have a site restoration group that is primarily responsible for remediation of contaminants landside, mostly made up of geologists. And when a lease or a property use changes, they conduct environmental site assessments and they're responsible as well for spills and releases. So they're emergency responders to anything that could go wrong at the port. They also do a lot of training um, for our construction and maintenance division, which I'm gonna talk about in a minute. So we talk, touched briefly on CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act. So anytime there's a discretionary permit, so not an administrative permit where you know, somebody just signs off on a piece of paper, but anytime um, there's a discretionary act, somebody has to make a choice about something, it goes, it triggers the CEQA process and that requires assessment and disclosure of any potential impacts and all of the details of the project so that we can ensure that the proper mitigation measures are put in place should they need to be. And that is all public. On to water. So we talked about the legacy contamination. This is what the port looked like. Prior to 1972's Clean Water Act, um, which was created or ratified by President Nixon at the time. And then we went to the Porter Cologne Act uh, for California, which was the Porter Cologne Water Quality Control Act, which expanded enforcement and policy development to the nine regional water quality control boards to protect water rights and water quality. Um, little fun fact about how bad the pollution was. Vessels, you know, they, um, they get biofouling and boring organisms stuck to the hulls. 
And the vessels used to drive into the port, which was so anoxic, so depleted of oxygen, that the organisms on the hulls would suffocate and fall off and die. Um, so let's see how far we've come from those days. I just also want to point out that some of the legacy pollutants came from the Montrose plant, which created DDT higher up in the watershed. We are at the terminus of the Dominguez Channel. And the Dominguez Channel is uh, the, the flood control, uh, channelized flood control that um, starts at LAX and Inglewood and travels all the way down past uh, these cities you see here, which are nine cities um, and the LA County Flood Control District. It encompasses 130 square miles, and there is an estuary portion. Um, the end of the Dominguez Channel is the beginning of the Port of Los Angeles at the, at the Consolidated Slip. So in the water, so, um, let's talk about the sources of ocean contaminants. So in the Water Resources Group, um, we looked at a comprehensive water resources management plan that we did in collaboration with the Port of Long Beach. And we created this document called the Water Resources Action Plan. And that was uh, finalized in 2008, and it was ratified by the Regional Water Quality Control Board and the EPA. And it addressed all the pathways of pollutants from landside runoff, aerial deposition, direct discharges from vessels, um, as well as our in-water structures like piers and pilings. And it also looked at sediment and sediment resuspension from vessel activity and the prop wash, and also uh, regional influences. It's meant to, it's a very comprehensive document, but it's meant to be a living document that is consistently updated. So what do we do in the resources group? There are four of us who do all of the things on this slide. Um, you might be familiar with the total maximum daily load, uh, TMDLs. It's, a, it's an allocation of the amount of pollutants that a water body can receive um, and still reach its attainment goals. So what it's meant to do um, for us, it's full immersion. Um, and so we do have two TMDLs in the Port of LA. We also work on mitigation from our various um, programs, anything that touches the water, anything that goes in water or over water, we assess if it needs to be mitigated for loss of water or anything, habitat. We look at vessels, discharges, attendant outreach program, clean marinas, and so on. I'm gonna go through most of these, so um, I won't say any more. We'll spend a moment on the Inner Cabrillo Beach since that's where the aquarium is located. Um, and so I mentioned the two TMDL locations. One of them is the Inner Cabrillo Beach. It is a bacteria TMDL. And um, we have a Greater Harbor Toxics TMDL, which addresses mostly legacy contaminants in the sediment throughout the port. Um, there are a couple of hot spots and listed water bodies. One of them is um, Fish Harbor and the other one is Consolidated Slip. So let's talk about um, Inner Cabrillo Beach for a moment. It's got some special characteristics, right? It's very enclosed in an industrial harbor. It has limited circulation, but it is also highly valuable habitat. There is a whole eelgrass bed right in front of the beach um, that supports all kinds of aquatic species and is a habitat for fish nurseries and ichthyoplankton. But it's fun to be at because it's calm and that's what makes it a mother's beach. Um, and we have done I wanna say about $24 million worth of renovations at this beach face um, to try and address the bacteria problem. We started with the infrastructure and looked underground at all the pipelines and um, all of the plumbing and everything that leads to the beach face. And we capped, diverted, 
and repaired anything that leaked or wasn't functioning properly. Then we also um, removed a rot groin to increase circulation and did a circulation study to see if clean outer harbor water would circulate and you know, make the bacteria problem disappear. Um, that didn't work. We also replaced all the sand on the beach with fresh sand because bacteria can propagate in the sand. Um, we also put up these um, bird excluders because during a microbial source tracking, we found that most of the bacteria on the beach is avian related. Um, we're not sure how much uh, risk that poses to bathers. So we're going down the process of doing a qualitative, quantitative microbial risk assessment. So assessing the risk that that bacteria could pose to bathers along with a natural source exclusion because the birds are naturally there. The Harbor Toxics TMDL, um, we used to do 22 different sampling locations and found statistically they weren't different enough. And we were able to narrow that down to 12 different locations. One dry and two wet weather samples are done every year. Um, we also look at the sediment um, in 22 different locations twice every five years. And um, we have fish consumption guidelines that are based on the um, Office of Environmental Health and Hazard Assessment, the OHIA guidelines. Um, and they're based on the guilds. So the types of fish that subsistence fishermen, local people who go to the fishing pier and would you know, catch food for their family, what they would be eating, what they're likely to catch. Um, so we're, that's an ongoing process. We also have developed and manage and follow the regulations around um, vessel discharge rules. And we work very closely with the US Coast Guard and the Port Police who are the enforcers of those rules. We've created some brochures and pamphlets that are also available on our website so that all boaters, regardless of the size of your vessel, know what is and what isn't allowed to be maintained at the port or um, what you can and cannot discharge. All right, my, one of my favorite programs, the Tenant Outreach Program. This was the first program I worked on at the port and I have to say, it is the reason I know the port like the back of my hand. This is a partnership um, between our tenants and the port. Um, I'm not a regulator. I do not work in a regulatory capacity, but because the tenants are, are using our land, we want to ensure that they are using our land in a manner that is consistent with the various stormwater permits that are applicable to their, um, their facility. Um, I see about 150, well, we have about 150 tenants that I consider part of the tenant outreach program because they have a potential to impact stormwater. So that would be fishing. As you see in the top left corner, that's a, a local fishery that brings in mostly squid and mackerel from local waters and um, offloads that and processes that. You can see the pelicans also enjoy that. Um, and the bottom left is liquid bulk terminal. So we still do have uh, liquid bulk, um, mostly, well, crude oil and um, gasoline and pipelines that go up to the refineries and back out. Um, and I'll just say that, you know, those were legacy contamination sources, but at this point, those are regulated by something like 21 various agencies. And while they have, a high impact should they fail, the likelihood of them failing is very small. Um, we haven't had any catastrophic spills or leaks from any of these terminals in a very long time. Um, in the top right corner, you can see what we call break bulk or non-containerized cargo. And that is our um, Nissan uh, Infinity um, uh, terminal where 
you can see this odd ship where we call that a roll on roll off ship or the the cargo drives on and then drives off so it rolls on and rolls off and then in the bottom picture one of my favorite facilities and also a big supporter of the cabrillo marine aquarium is cal sulfur we have two sulfur frillers or processors here so when sulfur is reduced in fuel they frill that sulfur and export it for fertilizer and other uses and we also see um, container yards, of course, and um, fruit importers who do fumigation when fruit is brought over from South America and restaurants. So I try to be helpful. Um, my goal is to collaborate with them and to help them understand, right? Their primary goals are not really water quality. Their primary goals are to get cargo in and out of the port. And they may not see everything that um, I need them to see, or I want them to see with regards to stormwater. So they are covered under a variety of different permits. And um, we suggest ways that they can improve their uh, best management practices in order to reduce any probability of those pollutants from their operations running off when it rains into the storm drains and out into the ocean or directly off of wharf infrastructure. Um, it's better that they hear it from me than they hear it from a regulator. It's a nice buffer because I'm not going to issue a fine to them, but I am going to help them get into compliance if they are not. And that includes their hazardous waste storage um, and a variety of other things. I also try to help them a little bit with their trash management and um, compliance with the, the assembly bills that require businesses to reduce um, their amount of trash to landfill and now to do um, green waste recycling. It's fun to help and I like to get to know people. They are, um, so everybody in the County of Los Angeles is subject to at least the municipal stormwater permit, which we call the MS4. It's the Municipal Separate Sewer Storm Sewer System Permit. Forces. And that is issued by the Regional Water Quality Control Board. Um, there is a state permit issued by the State Water Quality Control Board for all industrial facilities. And if your industry falls outside of what's considered general, you can be issued an individual NPDES permit from the Regional Water Quality Control Board. And so I go through um, and ensure that they are in compliance with those permits. I look at their stormwater pollution prevention plans that they are required to have, um, their annual sample results, and their sample reports. And should they have exceedances in those reports, I look at how they've addressed them. And I help collaborate with them on ways to improve. We also have a similar program for the Clean Marina. Um, the Clean Marina program, almost all of our marinas, uh, 17 of them are, I think we're 16 now, are certified clean marinas. Um, that means that they adhere to certain best business practices, including having a stormwater pollution prevention plan and being able to um, put boom around a vessel their largest vessel to collect any oil or any leakage from a boat that was maybe not maintained properly or had a leak. Um, we look at the fingers themselves. Uh, we look at the items that are stored on the boat. So, you know, boats move and sometimes prop wash knocks the docks and the fingers and things become unstable. So we make sure that the tenants are storing their boats in a way that will not, um, hopefully will not um, degrade water quality or create a hazard. Um, and you can see in the lower right hand corner, we also have collaborated with the Bureau of Sanitation, which provides um, oily rag, bilge cloth and um, oil filters and oil recycling centers. So those boaters have a place right there to collect um, in an environmentally friendly way all of their oily waste. 
Unfortunately, we also do get some illegal dumping and we try to educate users about that. So environmental management division is not the only division in the port, of course. We work very closely with our construction and maintenance division. So as a good landlord, we of course need to maintain our infrastructure. Um, and construction and maintenance is like a city that does all of those things. It's like a miniature city. You need something welded, you need your keys made, you have a repair, you have a plumbing issue, an electrical issue. Um, they do it. They do it all, including like vehicle maintenance, painting, sign making, um, and gardening. And um, they do all the pile driving. They do trash collection. They maintain our public areas and our parks. And um, they even maintain all of our trees. We have some arborists on board and we have a full um, urban forest. And we are actually in the process of cataloging and documenting all of our trees so that we can um, be more efficient with our tree maintenance and ensure that we know what native trees we have and we're um, keeping as much canopy as possible. Um, construction and maintenance is also the first um, internationally certified ISO 14001 um, facility in the West Coast, um, the EMS program, Environmental Management System program, is a very well-defined plan, do, check, act plan or system that has a management structure that's designed to address the impacts of an organization's activities. It has three major commitments. It is to fulfill compliance, um, protect the environment from pollutants, and continually improve those things. And what's really unique about the EMS program is it's really not like a typical program that's top down, your supervisor tells you what to do. This program really allows everybody within CNM to have a voice and to continually suggest ways that we can support them in making their job as environmentally friendly or protective as possible. And site restoration does a lot of training for them. Um, and I do their stormwater pollution prevention training annually, as well as uh, wildlife management training, um, which brings me to my next favorite thing, which is the California least turn nesting site. We're gonna talk a little bit later about um, how birds use the port, but the California least turn is the only, um, endangered species um, under both the U.S. Endangered Species Act and the California Fish and Wildlife Endangered Species um, that is protected under both. It is a migratory bird. It's called the least tern because it is the smallest of all the tern species. Um, it is an aerial fish forager that comes from somewhere in Mexico. We're not entirely sure where it winters. And it arrives at the Port of LA, they arrive at the Port of LA, and um, we are one of only a few nesting sites left in this Southern California area where they can come and, um, and nest. Um, so we protect 15 acres, as you can see in this aerial photo on the top left, that is dedicated on the busiest container terminal in the North America, we maintain 15.8 acres for these birds to come April through August and, and uh, reproduce. So construction and maintenance works very closely with us. They do all kinds of uh, hard work to get the site ready. So they um, remove vegetation, they repair chick fences, they put in signs so that helicopters and planes don't do engine out activities over the site during the nesting season. Um, they help us put down herbicide if need be. And we also have um, biologists, avian biologists who monitor the site. And um, it's very, um, it's this site has, you have to have permits to enter and security and they do all of the management reporting and um, 
uh, nest counts for all of the species uh, that nest there. So there are some other species that nest there, including the elegant tern, the Caspian tern, the royal tern, and black skimmers. So um, this is what they look like. They're very small, very beautiful birds. They make a little scrape in the sand with their uh, bellies, and that is the nest. They lay these tiny sand speckled eggs. And when the least turns come out, they are like fluffy ping pong balls. They're totally adorable. And um, we're glad to have them as the original inhabitants of the port. We also do some foraging studies to see uh, when, we, when we can every so often, every couple years or a few years to see how the birds utilize um, the port for fishing opportunities. So they fly over water and when they see a fish, they dive in and pluck it out. So construction and maintenance, I mentioned that they do a lot of wharf and pile uh, maintenance and repairs and replacements. Um, so what does that do to the marine life that lives in the water? So, um, we do have some regulations around that in water work. Um, we do train all of our construction and maintenance staff who works out there and any contractors who work with the port to do green sea turtle monitoring and marine mammal monitoring. Um, they are required to um, start the observations at least 15 minutes prior to beginning in water work where they're gonna start making vibrations or noises that could disturb um, animals in the water gives them an opportunity so we can see whether or not they're in the area and do a soft start to maybe get them to leave so we don't injure them in any way. Um, green sea turtles are here because the port has some really good feeding habitats that they're attracted to. They like these eelgrass beds that we have. Um, there's a hundred foot monitoring zone all around in the in water work. So in addition to my role as a biologist, um, I also support our chief sustainability officer, which happens to be the head of our division at Environmental Management Division, um, Chris Cannon. And I support him to implement all of the port's responsibilities under the City of LA's Green New Deal. Um, the Green New Deal is 12 chapters that outline an action plan to tackle the climate emergency with aggressive goals. And I just want to reiterate that sustainability is a, we call a three-legged stool that balances economic, social, and environmental um, responsibilities. So if something is environmental, but it's not an economic, it's not e either economically feasible or it doesn't help the economy, um, it wouldn't be considered a sustainable thing. So the Green New Deal has a, a road to five major zero categories, zero landfill, zero emission vehicles, zero net carbon buildings, um, renewable energy, and uh, wastewater recycling. Um, and at the port, we really are aggressive with our air quality goals and forwarding that zero emission vehicle demand. We also are working on food systems, uh, food waste and waste recovery from municipal and commercial demolitions or um, infrastructure changes. We are working on water reduction and green jobs. The port has also almost 10 megawatts of solar. And now the state of California is moving towards offshore wind and we would like to be positioned and ready to make sure that we can provide the infrastructure needed to support offshore wind projects. Um, and we're also working towards um, net zero carbon buildings um, and we're benchmarking our water and energy use through our municipal buildings. So how does all of this uh, work? Is it working? Well, we can only know by looking. So every 
five years, the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach collaborate on an intensive year long effort to evaluate all of the various habitats throughout the port. Um, we call it the biosurvey, although it's a biological survey. If I call it the biosurvey, um, that's what it is. We had an amazing team this last go around from wood, environment, and infrastructure. And all the photos you're about to see are all taken by them in the port. So just as a background, the port did start doing some evaluations in the um, 1950s, but we really started collaborating on a larger scale in 2000. It really helps us understand historical trends and areas within the harbor and how they're used by the original inhabitants of the harbor. And how do we compare to the rest of the region, the LA region? What is our habitat quality doing? Um, and once we know how well the habitat quality is doing, we can make informed decisions about mitigation measures. Back to CEQA. So it's a comprehensive survey of all of the structures, the water, the benthic environment, um, and the piers and pilings, as well as the riprap, the rocky outcroppings that we call riprap. Um, and it's like I said, it's a year long. We look at all the plants and animals in the complex and all the habitats, and um, it's uh, it's a very unique environment because we have all of these different um, habitats in such a in such close proximity to one another. It's really, an interesting place. Um, we try to keep our methods consistent enough that we can evaluate trends over time, but we also update our methodologies um, so that we can keep up with regional comparisons. And we also updated in 2018 um, our surveys of riprap and pilings, um, the hard structures. And of course, if you look, you will find. So let's see what we found. Well, what do we look for? Um, we look um, for invertebrates in the seabed and on the riprap and pilings. Um, we look at ichthyoplankton. We look at kelp and macroalgae. We look at the eelgrass beds, how birds use the port, marine mammals. And we also evaluate if we have non-native species coming in. We look at water column um, and the beaches um, and it's harbor wide. Again, all of these were taken right here. Look at Navinax and Harbor Seals. So this map shows the extent of the surveys. Um, we did mostly spring and summer sampling because it captures most of the, um, the species that utilize the port, except um, our Results showed us from previous surveys that ichthyoplankton also uh, would benefit from a winter survey, so we did that too. Um, we also surveyed mammals and birds every month for 12 consecutive months from a boat. So what's the big picture? Um, basically, we found 1,095 total species, and that's a lot. So we happen to think our programs are working quite well. Um, here's a table of our um, 10 commonly found fish and bird species. And a lot of these um, reef associated species or uh, benthic species were done using quadrats where you would just lay down you know, squares and scrape off what was there and it was very methodical. Um, this time we tried an updated method where you actually, the, the divers would actually look around and see what was around them because it doesn't capture, the quadrat math method doesn't capture swimmers. Um, and as a result, we saw 150 species not previously seen in previous um, biosurveys. Maybe a lot of that was just due to the methodology, but we found nine new species that are reef associated like the horn shark, which we always thought was here. 
Um, but surprisingly, we also found three types of abalone, uh, pink, green, and one white, which is highly endangered. That was actually um, removed and sent to, um, to, to be used um, for breeding, carefully removed, and it's successful. So um, we do some habitat comparisons because it allows us to understand what is most productive without the, with, throughout the harbor. Um, we've always known that outer harbor is more productive in general than inner harbor and dead and slips. Um, although that's been changing that we can document throughout the course of the um, bio baselines or the bio surveys, we've been able to see that inner harbor tends to look better and better um, over time. Um, we've also incorporated the new pile surveys um, which was, so as you can see here, the outer harbor had more um, diversity and more biomass and a higher abundance um, than inner harbor did. And also adult and larval fish were more diverse in the outer harbor, um, but they were similar in biomass and abundance to the inner harbor. Kelp is really only present in the outer harbor and that probably is a large contributor to the biological diversity. Um, and the demersal species like um, shrimp, white croaker, and queenfish were most abundant in deep areas throughout the port. Um, the deep also had an increased diversity in biomass for benthic invertebrates. Um, so let's look at the bird communities. They seem to be pretty consistent over time. Um, the 10 most abundant bird species have remained the same most abundant bird species. Um, and the least turn, uh, oh, the ten, those 10 top species uh, account for 90% of the total observations of birds throughout the harbor. Uh, it's a similar trend for fish. In the water column, um, the anchovies, top smelt, and California grunion were the most abundant pelagic fish, and the demersal fish were the queen fish, white croaker, barred sand bass, and California halibut. Um, about a third of the total of 100 species have been seen in all four surveys. Um, so, improvement over time. So, our water clarity has been improving. We have a um, test lab that goes out and monthly observes water clarity and clean water should equal larger amount of biological diversity. Um, and we do see that we have good water quality um, and that supports our eelgrass and um, in the summer of 2018, we saw a record high of 86 acres of eelgrass. And we also found it in deeper waters than we found before and in more areas of Inner Harbor. Um, eelgrass needs clean water to thrive and it is a great nursery habitat. So it might have also helped um, with the amount of, uh, the increase of species that we saw in the last survey. Um, we also find that the port is, um, has fantastic foraging, roosting, um, and nesting uh, places for um, all kinds of birds. And uh, 11 of the birds we saw are special status species. Of course, the endangered California leastern is the most, was the most, one of the most abundant birds. Three of um, the 10 were um, the, ele the elegant tern the uh, brown pelican, the great blue heron, I'm sorry, that should say four of the most abundant bird species observed in 2018 were special status. Um, so that was the elegant tern, the brown pelican, the great blue heron, and the double crested cormorant. Um, the habitats are also, some of them are, are um, 
regulated under the fishery management plans and um, abalone is um, one of those species um, and their size suggests that even though we've just saw them for the first time in the 2018 survey that they've probably been present for a long time um, and we just didn't see them. One of the things we look for are non-native species. And in the 2018 survey, we saw about um, 40, uh, 19 more non-native species than had been previously identified, but the percent of the total species still remains similar. And um, so the two of the top five most abundant benthic in fauna are non-native. Um, but the relative abundance of non-natives is higher in sediment and not on riprap or piles. Um, the non-native algae, like the sargassum and the andaria that are widely distributed throughout Southern California and the region, um, are not really crowding out canopy kelp at the port, um, further showing what a unique ecosystem we have here. Um, and that's really good. It's actually lower in the port than it is in other bays and harbors. So what is one of the things we found in this last biological survey was that the 2018 temperatures were warmer than they had been. Um, the survey was done following a 2014 through 2016 marine heat wave, and that might've had lasting impact. Um, throughout Southern California and at the port. And that impact might have led to the decrease in the larval fish species that we saw and um, some bird species, as well as uh, the, those shrimp populations increased. Uh, and it really just highlights, it puts a fine point on the need for the port to continue to lead in environmental change and to continue to reduce criteria pollutants from all source categories. Um, yeah, so in conclusion, the more you look, the more you see, um, we're continuing efforts to improve water quality and um, reduce sources of trash and litter contamination. Um, we're looking at sea level rise and changes in climate and how they will affect the port and the region and the diversity of species. Um, so the next step in this is that we are, uh, we're trying to take this to the next level and integrating it um, out to the public. Um, all of our new promenades should feature QR codes where you can scan and interact with our website. And you can see from where you stand what the biology is of the area of the port you're located in. We also have some really cool interactive web maps and um, other brochures, static brochures and so on to help reach the community and show them what uh, biological diversity is in the port. Um, our next steps is also to uh, use some new technologies. So we want to look at satellite imagery for kelp canopy um, and eelgrass beds and temperature. And we also would like to incorporate environmental DNA. So everything that sheds DNA into the environment, if you scoop that water and um, it can go through a library. And if it is identified in the library, you can figure out what species you have just from that scoop. Um, and in the last survey, we provided 200, uh, we have provided tissue samples from invertebrates and fish for the reference library to um, Natural History Museum and UCLA. And they were able to add 200 different species to their library. Um, and our next bio survey comes up very quickly. It'll be in 2023. And that concludes my presentation and I'm ready for questions. So uh, those of you that have questions, um, there's, there's a handful already in the Q&A, but um, those of you that have questions for Rachel, 
Um, please put them in the, the Q&A feature. Please don't put them in the chat, put them in Q&A and we'll go through them. Um, I'll read them out to her and, and um, we'll, we'll, we'll get through these questions. But first, um, be first, before we do that, Rachel, I wanted to ask you about, um, you mentioned a little bit about the layout of the port and one of the main inputs or that what drains into the port is the Dominguez Channel. And the Dominguez Channel has been in the news lately. <laughs> Um, can you talk a little bit about how that impacts what you guys do or how do you, how do you tease out what is coming from the Dominguez channel and what's coming from the actually from the port? It's not easy, um, but through the TMDL process, we have done a lot of sampling up the channel into the estuary and there is a Dominguez channel uh, watershed management group of which I am a part of. And that group is uh, tasked with collaboration on the different environmental issues that stem from each of their municipalities. Um, and so the Regional Water Quality Control Board has a, this uh, watershed management plan that was submitted to them and it has all these goals and uh, milestones and um, sampling requirements. Uh, but it is a multi-layered problem. Um, it includes access problems. You know, we can't go into the LA County Flood Control District and sample. That's not our, our territory, our, our jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of permissions and requirements. There's also um, some dangers. There's a lot new homeless encampments along the channel. Um, sometimes the sampling equipment gets um, dismantled in between checks and no longer can you read those data. So um, it, it poses a challenge and we, we try to collaborate and educate and work with the upstream cities, but they definitely have to do their part to reduce the amount of pollutants that come down into consolidated slip. And to that end, one of those things is that um, if consolidated slip is uh, it's a sink that is designed to do exactly what it's done, which is catch a lot of pollutants that come down the channel. And if we have to remediate those sediments in consolidated slip, they will be recontaminated as sediment travels down the Dominguez Channel. So we would really like to do it in a stepwise process that remediates upstream before remediating downstream. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we're going to get to some of these questions. Uh, it's so fun to, to recognize names in the um, in the participants in the Q&A. There's so many people I'm like, oh, hi. Oh, the first one is um, Alice. Uh, she's one of our teachers that, that um, use the aquarium. Alice is asking um, for, this is early on in your talk, Rachel, for the emissions inventory, can you explain what TEUs are? It shows it went up 23%. Yes, so TEU stands for 20 foot equivalent unit. Um, cargo comes in different sizes. So if you're measuring a cargo box, a uh, container box, they can be 40 feet, they can be 15 feet, they can be 20 feet and bigger or smaller. So instead of um, measure, you can't count each container because it's not, it's not indicative of the quantity of, um, cargo coming through. So we count every 20 feet as one unit. So just to standardize the unit. Okay. Yeah. Mary uh, asks, what does the landlord concept mean? Ships and businesses rent space from the city? Um, not exactly ships, although um, mariners do. So the um, there's only a couple spots within the port that are not owned by the port. There's the Coast Guard is owned by the Coast Guard and the prison is owned by the state. Um, and one more facility, the what was the Borax soap plant is owned by them as well. Everything else is um, owned by and entrusted to the city of Los Angeles. And um, we manage all of those properties and all of the tenants rent that space from us. Um, and they, you know, they pay dockage fees and they pay, you know, whatever the agreement is. I don't 
work in the real estate section, but there's all kinds of different lease agreements. Um, and you know, if you're a if you're a commercial fisherman, maybe you rent dock space um, and wharf space to main, you know, to put your equipment on. Um, yeah, so that's the landlord port scenario. We don't actually do any of the work itself of bringing in vessels or hooking them up or removing the cargo or using the gantry cranes or anything. We we don't do that and as port employees. Those are all longshoremen. Okay, Evie asks, what are ships allowed to discharge while in the harbor or waiting to get into the harbor? And the second part, also, how much auditory pollution do they create while waiting often for long periods of time to dock? How often does, how does the effect, how does that affect the animals, including marine mammals in the area? Oh, that's so, a multi-part question. I'll try yeah. and uh, answer it. Um, basically, ships are not really allowed to discharge anything in the harbor. Um, they mostly, uh, so like we have a cruise ship terminal and when cruise ships come in, all of that is piped onto shore to be treated on shore. Um, they are not allowed to do any bilge water uh, releases. Um, they're not really, uh, they can do some fresh water rinsing of their windows and decks, but that's pretty much it. Um, I think the next part was uh, noise pollution. Yeah. Um, so the port is a noisy place. Um, and the vessels themselves are not particularly noisy when they're, uh, they're waiting to dock. Um, the unfortunate part of waiting to dock is not the noise, it's the, it's the idling of the engines. Um, when they get to port, often they can plug in what's called cold ironing or what we call alternative maritime power. So they can plug into shore power so they don't have to run their engines in order to have power at the vessel. Um, and we also have a post, um, uh, we call it a sock on a stack, like an emissions control technology, like a bonnet that goes over the emissions stack so that it, it scrubs the stack um, through a series of equipment that's on the water. Um, that's a difficult process though. And um, how does it affect animals in the area? Not very much uh, while they're, while they're um, anchored or moored waiting. Um, I know that in the last few years, two years almost that's become um, on a, that's come on everybody's radar because of the supply chain issues. And you can see that our numbers really jumped um, during COVID, you know, people are ordering a lot more product. So there's a lot more ships. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. okay. You don't need that thing that you were gonna buy. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, next, next question is from Ann Dalkey. Hi, Ann. Um, for water quality and other marine oriented issues, does POLA have their own monitoring programs or does EMD conduct the monitoring or does POLA contract the effort out to monitoring companies? Oh, that's an interesting question. Of course, she knows a lot of those answers, I think. Um, so the, um, the Hyperion uh, Oceans Assessment Group and Monitoring Group do a lot of the shoreline monitoring at Inner Cabrillo Beach as they sample up and down the coast. Um, and um, we use consultants for anything beyond that, like for our sediment, um, sediment monitoring um, and wet weather monitoring and so on for TMDL compliance. And um, we also have an in-house uh, monitoring lab or test lab that can do, uh, they go out monthly to do water clarity observations as well as sampling during in water work. So that the, if there's a construction plume, like if you're driving a pile and it disturbs sediment, we make sure that that sediment doesn't travel beyond a certain radius that's been described in the project. And they make sure that that 
sediment is staying where it's supposed to stay. Okay, Liz wants to know, can you speak to the gray whales that are feeding in the shallow water habitat? What steps are being taken to protect these mammals and their habitat? As the water quality in the harbor improves, do you expect to see the number of gray whales in the shallow water habitat increase? So the shallow water habitat was not built for the whales. <laughs> um, and it's indicative of a larger problem that the whales were really hungry when they were migrating and they stopped in to munch on our eel grass and eat the invertebrates in the, in the sediment. Um, we don't have, uh, what, we, what we did when those whales came through is um, alert all of the boaters and the marinas um, and the Coast Guard and the port police and made them aware that the, the, they were there and to avoid them. Um, and then we just leave them alone and let them do what they need to do to fatten up so they can continue their migration. Um, and as far as the habitat itself, we, um, we maintain that habitat that is a mitigation bank. It is part of what we monitor and control and protect. Okay, uh, anonymous, what are engine out functions in aircraft? I, I guess that air, you know, the student um, pilot, they learn what to do in an engine out should an engine fail, they learn how to land the plane without an engine. And there are very few places around Los Angeles to do an engine out simulation. And, you know, the pilots see this sand, this like 15 acres of sand, and they think they can use it. And unfortunately, sometimes they use it during least nesting season, which would drive the birds crazy off their nests. And that is a violation of a variety of permits and acts. And um, I, I will, I, I touched on the least turn nesting season, but there's a lot more work that goes into preparation for that season. And that includes that I prepare and send out letters to all of the different um, airfields around Southern California region that might fly to us and all the flight schools. And I tell them with a map, you may not fly between April and August, do not disturb these birds, they're protected yeah. and so on. They're so cute, I love them. They're so cute. <laughs> uh, okay, not another anonymous. How much intertidal habitat has been lost by conversion to port infrastructure? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question exactly. The intertidal. Most of the port habitat. is constructed. Um, it wasn't originally like this. It it was, you know, mud flats and embayments, and it's it's not a natural environment. Um, but we still do have some intertidal. I, um, yeah, I maybe the like port the itself port, yeah. is actually supports a lot of habitat. Um, the riprap and the pilings are very rich habitat, it turns out. And when we take them out, we actually have to mitigate for loss of habitat. Yeah. It goes both ways. Yeah. It's interesting. OK. Um, this next one's a little long, Rachel. So um, uh, Jennifer wants to, she was, she was talking about this uh, paddle out plastic uh, program that she does. Um, so she, she cleans up in, uh, Cabrillo Inner Beach at low tide on a regular basis, thank you very much, Jennifer, on her kayak with Paddle Out Plastic, which was recently featured on Spectrum News. Uh, there's a big increase of plastic and trash in the port. Uh, what are you doing about it? Do you clean the beach so the plastics don't re-enter the ocean? Do you ensure all trash cans around the port are covered? Would you consider a campaign to encourage people using the port not to litter and educate them on the issues of plastics in the ocean. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I'm with you, Jennifer. Thank you for what you do. And I'm familiar with um, Paddle Out Plastic. 
Um, and we've we've um, we've addressed this a few times. And yes, um, one of the things I do when I go around to poor facilities and to tenant facilities is ensure that their trash cans are litted so that we don't get so much air air blown uh, litter coming out of them. Um, education is a really big part of it. Um, we did do a overland um, trash assessment, um, OVTA, um, of all of the port complex and found that the highest litter was associated with people, where people are. Um, it really is a people problem. Um, we do provide trash cans for truck drivers uh, where they queue. We also do clean up around there. Um, another thing is that there are trash provisions um, and the, the trash, we, trash provisions that through the state of California that are now being incorporated into the MS4 permit. And um, the city of LA is on track one, which is full capture for trash. We do not actually have a trash TMDL. And I know that you're seeing a lot of trash, but compared to other, uh, sorry, but compared to other um, channels, we actually are doing fairly well. Um, but the city of LA is full trash capture and they are in compliance with that. That means that they put in barriers in the storm drain inlets to prevent trash from migrating into those inlets and then out. But not all the municipalities up the Dominguez Channel have done that. Um, they either are behind or they're looking for funding through the Safe Clean Water uh, funding program. Um, there's, that's a, it's a multi-layered problem. We have, uh, you know, some port users and port employee or port workers that want to say longshoremen. Sometimes they're in a rush and they share vehicles and sometimes those earplugs and things end up on the ground uh, where they do migrate off the wharf. Um, it is something I do talk to tenants about regularly. I can't talk to everybody. Um, there are a lot of port users and, uh, yeah, we're trying very hard to look at where trash accumulates and then target those areas with different best management practices to prevent the trash from then my litter, not trash litter from migrating to the ocean, whether it's through wind or water transport. It's a good question. And and now we have the whole disposable mask problem, right? I mean, that's yeah. Just, Welcome to our next environmental problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I I will add to that. Um, I did mention earlier that the aquarium does a monthly beach cleanup. I know it's just at Cabrillo Beach area, and that's just a small section of the port. But um, the first month, the first Saturday of every month, uh, we do a beach cleanup on land um, throughout the beaches. We meet at nine a.m. And um, we always welcome help, but then we also do a couple very large beach cleanups throughout the year as well. We do one, of course, around Earth Day and then uh, Coastal Cleanup Day, which is in September. And then we do one um, the day after the 4th of July, and we call that Trash Mageddon. Um, <laughs> so on July 5th every year, we have Trash Mageddon and we have to clean up Cabrillo Beach because um, it's pretty crazy after that. So. Um, Thank you for all that you do. Uh, and it's, yeah, it's a big problem. Okay. Um, I also just, I didn't address one part of that, which is the beaches. The beaches are maintained, the outer beach is maintained by LA County and the inner beach is maintained by LA City. Um, and right. they, they rake the trash and empty trash cans and maintain that area. Okay, um, next question, Randall um, asked this early on and that you kind of addressed it, but I don't know if you maybe wanna add, um, he wanted to know about, do you use eDNA techniques um, or do you have plans to do so in the future? Um, we were really ambitious this time around to use eDNA. Um, eDNA is, um, you know, it's emerging. Uh, the library for fish is probably at about, 50% and the invertebrate um, library was much lower than that. So while we did contribute to the library, it's not quite robust enough for what we're looking for at this point. Um, and we hope to continue to contribute to that effort. Um, 
it's it was really interesting and it's its own it's its own paper that we didn't include in the bio surveys this time um, but it should be published and available for review on our website cool. okay uh, Katie wants to know what are the top 10 most abundant bird species found in the harbor hmm. I don't know if we'd be able to list them off the top of your head you did the top four I don't know did do the top four. Um, let me see if I can answer your question. The top 10 bird species. Ooh. Um, the Western gull, the brown pelican, France cormorant, California gull, the Western Grebe, Kierman's Gulls, Peregrine Falcon, Rock Dove, Surf Scooters, and Double Crested Cormorants. Cool. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, Shauna wants to know, can you tell us more about whether or how invasive species are monitored either by land or sea um, by cargo or ballast water, um, for example? Yeah, so ballast water is regulated um, by the state and the government and um, ballast water exchange needs to occur in the middle of the crossing of the ocean where it's unlikely for those species to survive. Um, ballast water is not allowed to be discharged within the port. Um, of course, uh, things make their way there's a will to live and um, whether it's from hull and prop fouling organisms that may fall off or some water that gets released, um, the organisms do make their way um, into the port and maybe not just from cargo, but from other vessels and other operations, whether it's like fish imports and then maybe some illegal dumping during fish processing that can happen. Um, there's all kinds of reasons that foreign objects get found in our waters. Um, there's not a whole lot we can do about it, although we are we do have an aggressive Calerpa mitigation plan. So um, before we do any in-water work, we do a Calerpa survey to ensure that we're not disturbing Calerpa and spreading it around. Um, so, so far, so good on that. Um, I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Um, let's see, Tova says, great job, Rachel, thank you. My question is, I'm curious to know what species detected in the recent survey was the biggest surprise to your team? Easy answer, the white abalone. <laughs> I was gonna say, I, when you were saying that, I'm like, what? I didn't know these Right? Yeah. yeah, we all geeked out over that one. So yeah. that was amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then um, the diver who found the abalone, Kevin Stolen Stolzenbach, who was the like the lead on the bio survey, he gave us each um, abalone shells that he had found in the port. So they're all on our desk. Oh, that's cool. Very cool. I'll have to talk to you more later Thanks, about Tova. where where you at. That's really cool. Okay, um, let's do a few more. Um, Amanda wants to know has the least turned population increased on pier 400 over the years um that's a that's a multi-layered question the the heyday for the least turn was like um 2000s we had over a thousand nesting pairs at that time um and it it sort of built up in about 200 per year until it reached about a thousand and then it dropped off at a rate of about 200 per year until we had zero um, in 2010 or 11. Um, and I've steadily been uh, in about somewhere between 160 uh, to 250 nesting pairs. Um, and each pair lays between one and two eggs. Um, and those eggs are often predated by other species around. Um, so predator management then becomes the number one driver 
as well as fish stocks. That's the one thing we really cannot control. We can set the table, but if they can't eat, there's really nothing else we can do. But we prepare the site as best we can. We give them tiles to shelter in and hide in. Um, we do the surveys in a method that doesn't allow crows and ravens to like follow footprints around to find all of the eggs and the chicks. Um, but, uh, and we, we try to remove predators that are detrimental or non-native like cats. Cats get dumped down there a lot and um, they also are detrimental to the colony. Um, so to answer your question, it's kind of stabilized now at about 100 and 150 to 250 nests per year. Can you can you elaborate on what you were talking talking about the the footprints? Oh gosh, well I don't what know if you came up with the term we bird brain, yeah. but crows and ravens are incredibly smart birds, um, and they the, the least terms are very cryptic. They blend right into the sand. And if you're not, it's very, they're very hard to find, but our bird monitors will go out and do nest surveys once or twice a week. And they'll walk a particular pattern throughout the 15 acres and stop when they see a nest and they put in, um, they put in uh, tongue depressors, popsicle sticks with the nest number on them facing in two directions. And the, the birds just follow the footprints to the stick and then they find the nest and they eat the they eat the eggs. So <laughs> monitors have to outsmart crows and ravens, which is very difficult. They can count, they can recognize your car and your hat um, and what you wear in the field. They um they'll they have a lot of patience and will outweight you. Um, so when it's time to leave your monitoring session, then they just swoop in and follow your tracks. That's crazy. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Rachel. I, I we're gonna we're gonna leave leave it with that, and I'll just let everybody kind of ponder that for a moment and think about how <laughs> these ravens are following footprints to their to their food source. That that just blows my mind. So. Um, Thank you again to our speaker, Rachel McPherson. Thanks again to the Friends of Cabrillo Marine Aquarium and the City of Los Angeles for their support. We apologize if we couldn't get to all your questions, but it's starting to get late. Um, once again, our upcoming online lecture is Friday, April 1st, 2022. And our speaker is Dr. Mario Espinoza from the University of Costa Rica. The title of his talk is turning the tide for sharks and rays in Costa Rica. More information can be found on Cabrillo Marine Aquarium's website. And a reminder, we have recorded this lecture and we will post it on our website soon. Thank you again for joining us. Stay safe. I hope to see you next time and good night. Good night. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having me, Julie. Yes, of course. Thanks, Rachel.